Welcome everybody to Inside the Magic Circle. This is Jason Augustus Newcomb and I am speaking to a gentleman today who uh, there are so many fascinating things about. He's a clinical psychologist in private practice, uh, practicing both Jungian and um, cognitive behavioral uh, therapies. Um, at the same time, he's also the head of the Temple of the Silver Star and a fairly high up person in the OTO and AA um, in the Thelemic lineages. So he, he has a, a, a wide breadth of, of knowledge and experience. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can you know, sort of contain it into a, into a single conversation. But um, I'm speaking of uh, David Shoemaker, very, very much welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm doing great. So to begin with, um, I, like to, I like to get sort of people's story of, of, sure. of how they came into this from the very beginning if possible. So what brought you in? You've been involved for almost 30 years in, in the magical community. Hard to believe. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, my gateway drug, if you will, was Carl Jung. Um, I was studying psychology and uh, uh, had always been drawn to the sort of more, more mystical side of things that, that Jung's work encompassed. Uh, I, I wasn't approaching it at all as a spiritual thing. In fact, I was a pretty diehard atheist at the time. And um, along the way, though, exploring young, I think, awakened me to the fact that I was actually searching for something uh, akin to a spiritual path, which had mostly been addressed uh, indirectly through my musical pursuits, which are very uh, much in the same vein for me. But, uh, but I hadn't labeled it as a spiritual path. So Jung kind of got me into looking around at, at other alternative uh, spiritual approaches. I found, um, I somehow found Rigardi, um, mm -hmm. and in particular, the Middle Pillar book, where he's writing about uh, Kabbalistic psychology and its overlap with, with Jungian psychology, and also, of course, talking about Crowley. So that was simultaneously my awakening to a ceremonial magic path, but also pretty much immediately um, the the thelemic path of Aleister Crowley. Um, what was what was it about the thelemic path that drew you in um, above everything else that's out there? Um, first of all, once I actually started to read Crowley as opposed to just read about Crowley, mm -hmm. um, I realized uh, his, his brilliance, um, his humor, uh, his uh, thoroughness in you know helping people approach the path in a way that could include um, deeply moving uh, emotional experience and trans and, you know, transpersonal, transcendental experience, but also you don't have to leave your brain at the door. You know, uh, it's not a fairy tale religion where you have to, um, you know, believe that the fairy stories in order to work the path. So I appreciated his, his uh, rational approach to a spiritual path is, his skeptical approach, um, his uh, use of what he would term scientific illuminism or the sort of the application of behavioral science principles to, to inner spiritual experience. So all of that together, and it, and it meshed really well with, with what I'd been studying in Jung too. Well, uh, let, let's start there. What, what, it, what in Jung drew you into the, the magical sphere and, and how did that sort of dovetail with Thelema for you? Um, I think that it was the only, you know, I was in the middle of graduate school um, when I found Thelema. So I was studying all kinds of personality theories and all kinds of clinical theories, theories of, of practice. Mm -hmm. And um, Jung's work was the only one at the time that, um, that felt to me like it could encompass actual human experience, just the, the mysteries and the wonder of being alive and what that's like inside and out. Um, no one was coming close to Jung in that regard in terms of his, his uh, discussion of the archetypes and the, what is essentially a collective mind that is shared at, at a deep level by all humanity. Um, the way that the, uh, that symbols and myths and dreams um, make up such a big part of the human experience and how to dialogue with that from, from a conscious place. So, um, that was prefiguring, obviously getting into to magic and, and doing similar things, but in a, you know, kind of labeled as I'm talking to, to spirits or I'm talking to my 
holy guardian angel or you know whatever you want to term it um do you think that so, most Jungian psychologists end up becoming somewhat mystical in their approach to things? Uh, you, you probably know more of them than I do. Yeah, I think uh, I think at least that they have an openness. I, I think they're functionally more mystical. <laughs> I don't know if they term themselves that uh, necessarily across the board, but I, I do think it creates it necessitates really a, an openness to the invisible and uh, the seemingly invisible and the symbolic and and yeah i asked that partly because uh I, that was exactly what freud warned jung against right <laughs> was that, was that it would it would lead to a black tide of occultism yeah it is sort of kids these days uh uh chiding of jung for being too mystical you know? <laughs> right. um uh yeah exactly so so jung was he knew he was he was approaching mystical topics but he he always held himself up as a scientist first and by today's standards, you would be very much uh, not a hard scientist, but um, but he held himself up as a scientist studying the psychological experience of religion or uh, the inner life of, of dreams and symbols rather than, um, at least publicly, rather than, um, than as a, a, an actual religious practitioner that, you know, founding a, a school of thought in that way. Isn't isn't Jung's definition of, of psychology somewhat more accurate than Freud's too? I mean, not, not just because of their beliefs, but just simply because psychology is the study of the soul, right? So, you know, looking, <laughs> looking at things overly clinically is um, not really very soul oriented, I wouldn't think. Do you consider yourself a hard scientist in, in terms of your psychological practice? Um, I, I, I bring... A, I weave together a lot of stuff. So I, I definitely am using like from the cognitive behavioral side of things, I'm definitely using, you know, empirically validated approaches to working on certain sets of symptoms, but that's not the only way I approach things. And so there's another part of my practice for those who are drawn to that and, and ripe for that, which is much more expansive and much less rooted in, in, in empirical science, like the dream work or, um, you know, some of the, the coaching I do, I do professional coaching as part of my, my practice as well. And, and a lot of that, uh, especially in the last year or so, has been with spiritually inclined people who, who are, you know, looking for a, a, a coach they can work with to have some common language. I have a lot of fellow mites actually on my... I was, I was going to ask, do you have a lot of, um, you know, fellow occultists who end up becoming your, your patients or clients? Uh, yeah, I do. And I, I, one thing I never do, though, is I never take as a as a client um someone who's actually working with me in one of the organizations that mm -hmm. i work with because I, I really do want to keep those those separate sure. but um but increasingly i'm finding people around the world who uh, you know contact me and want to do coaching work but they want they're drawn because they they are adherents of philema or magic broadly and they want somebody who's kind of sophisticated uh in their ability to at least speak that language with them which is kind of rare do you have do most people who come to you realize that you're an author and that you've and that you you know sort of run all these spiritual organizations or do you have clients that are completely outside of that awareness in in the psychology the, the sort of the therapy part of the practice um i'd say unless they're just not saying that they know these things um i say the vast majority know nothing about my my you know, religious pursuits is strictly, you know, they, their insurance company says, here's a list of providers you can go to. And, wow. And they come to. That would be interesting to, to, to come to that realization. Have you had someone realize who you were and then go, oh, I'd like to know more about this, please. please." That has me. happened. That has happened. And probably the opposite where they're like, I'm out of here, you know, but they don't <laughs> yeah, tell me yeah. that's why they're out of there. <laughs> right. um, so, 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 so it's, back, it's to back to your story, back to your story. Going ahead a little bit uh, forward, just for a second, um, mm -hmm. you you mentioned that you know you were an atheist coming in, and that one of the things you liked about Salima is that you don't have to sort of buy into a bunch of you said fairy tales. I think um, right. about you know various uh, historical figures, but there is a certain sort of mythology within sure. Salima, both both in the person of Aleister Crowley and then in in the sort of metaphysical system that's that's kind of grown up around it as well. Yeah. Um, how do you view that personally? Um, first of all, I, I, I will come right out and say I'm not a very good fundamentalist. Um, so 
my approach to Thelema is much more about um, utilizing the system Crowley left behind in the AA and in, in the Temple of the Silver Star that, that works from the same principles. Mm -hmm. um, those are two separate organizations, of course, but. Um, I want to talk about that at some point during this conversation. Sure, sure. But, um, but so you. But Crowley's. You the, in terms of the mythology, yeah. um, I um, I don't I, I think the the system is important, and I think what's crucially important is the doctrine of true will itself. Well, each where each of us, if I can define it for people who may not know, um, the true will is uh, first of all the word thelema is the Greek word for will, right. and the the will in question is the will of the deepest inmost self, the the basic nature uh, in terms of the way we live our lives, the um, effect we have on the world, the right place and right way for us to interact with the world based on our, our true nature. And Crowley's teachings of true will say that the purpose of life um, and certainly the purpose of magical training is to help aspirants come into conscious awareness of their true will and live it out vibrantly and passionately and uh, therefore sort of by, def by definition efficiently in that the true will of the individual meshes with the will of the universe, that this is the most harm harmonious way we can live a life is to be in touch with that truth of who we are. So that to me is the essential element of being a Thelemite, quote unquote, and um, believing in, I'll put that in air quotes for those who can't see it, um, believing in this mythology, the founding myth, if you will, of Crowley um, and the Book of the Law and, and all of that, to me is an individual matter. And certainly I, I've seen definitively in terms of the way people work the system, that believing in that stuff is not a necessary element to progress. That doesn't mean that I think it's not true. It doesn't mean that I insist it is true, but I do want everyone to have access to the system on their own terms and, and to come to believing things or not believing things based on their own experience, like Crowley would, I think, want in terms of uh, a, a rational skeptical approach to these things. Now, I, I know that this may be a, a fairly nuanced answer, but one of the reasons I'm doing these interviews is because I kind of want to know what people actually are believing in their in their cells. Sure. <laughs> so, so um, your answer was, you know, was broad. Like, what, what, what about you and your life? Uh, how, how does how do those myths affect you? I uh, I experience the thelemic current as a real thing that is um, the, basically the 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 current of human evolution which I believe is, is divinely guided, um, but we can define those terms later. Um, and I believe this process of evolution is, has been and is uh, bringing us to a place where there is a greater awareness of individual liberty and a greater, the more people pay attention to it, a greater focus in society or available uh, focus in society on creating a world where there's more liberty uh for the individual and and uh room for the true will to live itself out um i so i i believe that crowley was a herald of that and that the holy books that he uh brought through uh, have a have a quality to them that to me speaks of, of something beyond a simple human ego construction um and my own personal experience with magic and with the magical path and with my old guardian angel and with interactions with spirits and other entities brings me to a place where, where that feels like it has a validity beyond and a reality beyond mere, you know, parts of the brain talking to me or, you know, that I symbolize as spirits or something like that. I think because I, because I'm a psychologist and I've, talked a lot about psychological angles on these things there's some misunderstanding understandably understandable misunderstanding um out there that that somehow i believe magic is just psychology but if you 
actually pay attention to what I've said. I think it's pretty obvious that I'm I'm speaking from a place of of a spiritual reality beyond the the mere brain. It seems like because Alistair Crowley wrote uh, in a few places things like "Your Holy Guardian is your subconscious" or "Your or Angel right. is your subconscious," and you know uh, the the Goetia are parts of the mind and things like you know he he right. made these sort of statements. And I think so. I think almost all philemic magicians get sort of thrown into the bin of psychological magicians no matter what their personal perspectives are so i'm glad you i'm glad yeah. you shared that um so and what, you could just quickly you can see crowley's thought evol evolving on that over the years sure. and him saying emphasizing different aspects of it to different people depending on what he felt they needed to hear at the time right you know, for their own growth you know that's one of the things that's missing from the written word that's been collected is you don't know who it was being spoken to and i think it's, I think it's mm -hmm. important to think about that with with all kinds of writings you know out there that people are people are addressing an audience and they might not be saying completely what they're thinking they're just saying right. what what is going to serve the purpose of, of that moment um so let's go back to this uh, divinely guided um <laughs> subject that you brought up so um what what, what does that mean to you um, and, and I mentioned that in context of uh, human evolution being divinely guided, and it mm -hmm. it um, it appears to me, based on my own experience, that uh, and so I would say this is my religious belief system, if you want to call it that, um, that there is a, a, a unitary divine force, which is the motive force behind all universal processes that manifests itself in increasingly um, tangible, invisible ways um, as you come down what we would call the tree of life of the Kabbalah. I'm a Kabbalistic, uh, it's a Kabbalistic spirituality at, at root. Um, and um, the the motion and direction of that unitive force finds its voice in each living thing. Um, and in humans, at least, um, that voice is the, the voice of the divine truth of that individual. So it's like the, the particular ray of light shining through that individual's life but the, the source of that light is this unitary uh, divine source. And so, I mean, in, in some ways, Crowley felt like he solved a dilemma with the idea of Thelema or was given an answer to the, to the dilemma in the, the, the idea of free will versus predestination. So right. um, you, you, um, you, you are running a, a couple of different organizations at this point. Um, so how, how did we get from reading, you know, Jung and then, and then Rigardi to, to you running, where, where, how, did, how did that story unfold? Um, good question. Um, sometimes I ask myself, how did this happen? Um, but uh, I, right around 19, well, exactly 1993 is when I joined kind of everything I've joined. Um, I joined, I started in the, the student path of AA. I started. Um, I took initiation into OTO and I uh, started on the broader path, the broader tradition, which for in my world has evolved in the Temple of the Silver Star, sort of a polemic golden dawn uh, approach. Um, and um, so in 1993, I joined all these things uh, in my excited youthful way. And um, well, I guess I was 25. Um, so later than some people come to it, actually, but it's that's what I do. And uh, um, my wife at the time was from Sacramento, and so uh, of course uh, I was aware pretty early on of Phyllis Seckler's work in Philema, the, who was uh, um, a member of Agape Lodge of OTO in the 1930s and 40s. Um, an AA student under Jane Wolf, an important thelemite in terms of the resurgence of OTO in the 60s. Right. One, of, um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the people who has represented a true through line from, from 
really the golden dawn even you know like the, right yeah. right that's right and so i was aware of her work um she lived at the time in oroville which was about an hour and a half north of sacramento so on a visit to my then wife's family in sacramento i took a road trip up to oroville to to meet phyllis and uh i guess she took a liking to me from the beginning and we we started uh working together at a distance but then uh, i moved to california i moved to sacramento in 1997 and started uh, uh she took me on as her, her direct student in AA and I started working with her more or less, um, you know, once or twice a month, uh, either our own one-on-one -on -one conversations or um, were uh, group work up there. Um, she was still doing public classes at that time, semi-public where a small group of students would come to her house and she'd give everybody a white wine and toast and uh, <laughs> we'd have a good time. So this, this might... So, this might get us into a little bit of a sticky wicket area, but I'm just I'm 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 curious because you mentioned that you became a student of AA um, in in you know at the beginning, and then you became Phyllis Eckler's student a little bit later. With does that represent two different sort of AA streams that you were no. involved in, or was it always the same thing? No, the the person who admitted me to AA was a direct student of Phyllis's already, so all I did was sort of as a as a probationer moved out there and it's like well i'm here with you now phyllis and can i please study with you <laughs> so, so how, that, how do that's all how these there, there's a number of sort of aa claimants mm -hmm. i guess is <laughs> the, yeah, the right that's, word. that's my word i like yeah um at at this point uh do you do you all get along or is there is there contention between them i think uh that, that there's gradations of that there's there's some um i mean first of all i have friends and magical colleagues working in many of them um, and of the different claimant groups of AA. And so I know that there are good people doing good work in all these places. And so I, I don't have any personal, um, you know, negativity toward, towards anybody. I want people to have access to the system and I want them to be able to, um, to have a spiritual home that feels right to them. So if that's in some other a claimant group, I'm not going to be upset by that at all. I, what would be the point of me wanting them to be somewhere that's not good for them? Uh, so, uh, so that's that's my take on it. I, I have, it, it it is evident um, in the way the outer world functions that some people do have a problem with, you know, they're in one group and they have a problem with another group that's coming mm -hmm. to be AA. So that that definitely happens, but um, the solution, as always, is to kind of stay focused on the work itself. It seems to me. Not to not to keep going through the gutter here, but <laughs> are there are there are there are there groups out there or um, lineages out there that that you feel are not actually connected with um, anything historically? Are there people who are claiming that their teacher was a student of X, Y, or Z that that that's not true? Do you know if that is going on? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's there's outright frauds out there. There are people who are claiming to be legitimate. Where I, you know privately question the historical legitimacy of what they're claiming but i, I i'm not the a police and i'm not going to go out there and sure. even speak publicly in terms of um you know naming uh things i i think aren't aren't uh, legitimate but uh sure that's out there like like any tradition there's going to be frauds sure well this is a small tradition so it's kind of to me it's it's strange how many variations there are considering <laughs> right how it's not really that big of a of a thing but i guess i mean you know magic comes with the danger of ego inflation i guess as a as an inherent part of it it definitely doesn't i think the aa system in that it is it hinges on one to one mm -hmm. student teacher relationships makes it easier for there to be a wider net of people who have fraudulent claims uh as opposed to something that's um that has traditionally been more tightly uh, administered uh centrally we do administer AA centrally but there's a lot of a lot of people out there claiming to work in the AA system that mm. aren't claiming a connection to any sort of administrative structure but your your administrative structure is just from your lineage just doesn't include the other large lineage right or does it uh no each you know, I can speak to my own uh, claimant uh, 
group as well as uh, the two or three other major ones that are visible mostly mm -hmm. out there that um, that we have separate, you know, separate rosters, separate administrative triads and such. So um, you you run an interesting uh, situation where you have both an AA lineage that you're working through, but you also have the Temple of the Silver Star that mm -hmm. is a, a more of a group oriented um, yeah. thing. And so um, what are the benefits and the and the the pitfalls of both of those ways of approaching things? I want to start answering that question by uh, oops, um, sort of finishing the thread of how I got okay. to be yeah, in these no, things yeah, to begin yeah. with, because yeah, I think it'll lead right in. Um, I intended to, and, um, and I want to answer your question. So uh, basically, once once I got connected with Phyllis, um, you know, that was ninety seven. She died in uh, two thousand four, and over those years, we got closer and closer. She was really uh, my best friend at, at the time of her death, and um, by the time of her death, in, in the final years, had had essentially rewritten her will and, and reconfigured the way she wanted to have a spiritual legacy to um, to have me um, continue the traditions that she was working in, uh, including AA. And so um, that's how I got to to be in the position of of leadership where it was. Um, it was with the Temple of the Star. It was a new Temple of the Silver Star. is a new organization coming out of a long tradition that was unbroken, but the authorization, as with AA, came through uh, Phyllis. So, to speak to the different organizations and kind of what they do, um, first of all, it's important to note because this is a major point of misunderstanding that AA and the Temple of the Silver Star are, are not the same thing. Um, and the AA is not merely the second order uh, or inner order of the Temple of the Silver Star either. Um, these are completely different systems. Um, and, you know, for AA, um, this, is, this works better for people who are drawn to a solitary one-on-one -on -one, uh, teacher-student experience. There are some group initiation rituals um, for neophyte and zealotors to the early grades um but uh, for the most part you're is you're only going to meet your teacher um, and whatever students you have um so that's and it's kind of sink or swim you jump in uh early on to a huge swath of curly's writings and traditional materials and uh if you don't have any preparation and foundation in basic magical practice or diary keeping or um some of the the traditional, uh, you know, foundational tools like Kabbalah and things like that, um, it's it's pretty challenging. So, um, one of Phyllis Eckler's gifts to the world was uh, to start working with uh, her College of Philema at the time and um, help people get those foundational uh, materials locked in. So, what we do in the Temple of the Silver Star as a continuation of, of Phyllis's work is start people right off the street that might this might be the very first magical study they ever do but you know as long as they have a basic grasp of what they're getting into in terms of philema and magic um we take them from the ground up and and give them all of the kabbalistic astrological ritual meditative tools that um that are good on their own plane you know you don't have to be preparing yourself for aa for this to be useful but uh, many people do find that Temple of the Silver Star is a helpful preparatory phase before later pursuing AA work, but it's also freestanding. So someone could come in the Temple of the Silver Star and um, it, you know, the system is designed to take them from walking off the street as a newbie to knowledge and conversation of the HTA over the course of the first and second orders, which is many years of practice. So, so they, they can be completely separate from one another. They're not, they're right. not something that you, there, at a certain point, you go, well, I guess I better get into AA. You can just right. build Temple of the Silver Star. What's the relationship bet between the Temple of the Silver Star and um, the College of Thelema? I, I thought uh, Jim Eshelman at one point was uh, running right. the College of Thelema. What, what happened right. there? Right. So um, so I'd been involved in the College of Thelema, Temple of Thelema, uh, until 2008. And then um, we started Temple of the Silver Star at that time under the, the warrant that had been written 
to me by Phyllis. Um, so at that point, um, my work diverged from from Eshelman's in terms of the the College of Philema, Temple of Philema. So we grew out of this, obviously the major influence of Phyllis Sackler um, as as a training person in our lives um, and huge influence. Um, but uh, but that's where the systems diverged. You you and Jim just decided not to work together anymore, or or right like Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> Um, now that's an analogy I'd never heard before, uh, but, uh, um, yeah, at the, you know, and I, I have a lot of respect for, for Jim's work. So it's not, it's not that I'm, uh, holding any negativity toward him, but it was important for, for me to, to, to step away at that time based on how, uh, how things were, were going. And, and the college of, and Temple of Lima, do they still exist or is that gone at this point? Uh, as far as I know, they still exist. I, I since I haven't been involved at all since 2008, I have no idea how, how active they are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know either. Cause I, I haven't been involved in, in the Philemic community since about that same time period. So yeah. not, not that I've been uninvolved, but I just haven't been actively involved in anything cause I've been doing my own thing. But anyway, um, the, the, the group work that you do with the, the Temple of the Silver Star, is that is that like a regular lodge you're getting together every month and, and doing stuff? Mm -hmm. Is that is that how exactly. it works? But then it exactly. also has a, it also has a training curriculum as a part of that as well. Right. The the exciting thing to me and always has been about the this tradition and, and its manifestation in the in tots for short, Temple of the Silver Star. Um, is that we are simultaneously uh, in service to AA. So we've got the Thelemic lineage there in terms of the, the tradition and, the, and the, the doctrine of true will as a central principle that guides all we do. But we're also an unbroken lineal successor to the Golden Dawn. So we've emerged out of a succession of orders that trace themselves back to, to Mathers and the Golden Dawn um, as a living, tradition so that at no point in in our history or the history of our predecessors was someone simply picking up a book and saying let's start a golden dawn thing mm -hmm. this this is a succession of of groups that have met every month with a living continuation of administration and institutional memory and growth in terms of the tools and techniques used including a lot gradually, you know, a lot more depth psychology, um, eventually integrating to Lima. And um, to, to me, the, the richness of that continuity combined with the fact that it's a living system that is continuing to evolve is, is really important to me. Uh, and I think benefits the work we do. So we meet every month for a local, where there's a local uh, temple or Perneos. And um, there is a, a ritual that's the same ritual is done every month. Um, and uh, the same people are there every month. We have uh, what would be familiar to someone who's familiar with Golden Dawn work uh, in terms of the style of the ritual and so on. Um, but it's all been uh, and continues to, to be evolved in, the, in light of the Thelemic current and in light of um, you know, new discoveries of, of the adepts in the system uh, in terms of integrating, for example, um, my work with the Enochian Aethers that's published in the book, The Winds of Wisdom. Um, a lot of material was brought through to me during those experiences that has now been integrated into the Temple of the Silver Star as, um, as uh, either uh, first or second order teachings. This, this is something that actually is, I, I've thought about a lot over the years, um, and, I'm, and I'm glad to hear that you're, that you're doing this, which is that um, Crowley defined his AA system as scientific illuminism, as the method of science, but the aim of religion. But for the most part, what I've seen is that a lot of it became ossified in mm -hmm. you know, the, the early 1900s and hasn't changed or grown in any way since then. And so people right. are still forced to do the exact same things that he thought might be a good idea 120 years ago um, right. as opposed to where we might be today um, so so what how much how much have you grown the system from what it was that you received at this point um, how much is a hard question to answer but what i can tell you is that 
um, just because how, how could we even define that? But um, okay, just what, I'll, I'll, let me let me let me just give you an example. Do you, do sure. you have do you have people cut themselves with razors? <laughs> okay, so you're you're talking more about sort of traditional AA. Uh, yeah, the, the, like the, the technology, the scientific yeah. <laughs> technology. Yeah. yeah, we have uh, we pass out razors at the door, and no, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, there's there's a lot of um, what in, in Temple of the Silver Star. You know, there's so much unique proprietary material that's never been published. Um, mm -hmm we you know the, the curriculum of of tots doesn't even rely on specific aa libers there's just a whole bunch of stuff that grows out of the thelemic tradition the golden dawn tradition um traditions influenced by the rm solis and uh, uh, paul foster case's work in bota so there's all these threads um mathers alpha and omega you know his sort of successor to the, the original uh, hodgd yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of fingerprints, a lot of uh, permutations over the years. And now, especially now that we've uh, got to a place where a lot of the, the visionary work from, from my Enochian work has been integrated into the system, you know, it's, it's not going to bear much, um, you know, literal resemblance to some document that Crowley wrote um, in 1909. But that's the silver, the temple of the silver star within the right. AA, which is, I guess, silver star in in Greek or Latin. But um, right. <laughs> a but, source uh, of confusion. Probably. Yeah, right. In, in in that system, do you, are you still doing the same curriculum that would have been done then, or have you modified that a bit as well? So in AA, we we um, teach and train and test strictly in accordance with Libra one eighty five Crowley's um, map of the order. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we, in, in all the traditional libri, um, libers, uh, but, uh, but that there's doesn't mean that there's plenty of room for, uh, for implementation in ways that are unique and grow the system. So it's, it's kind of both. We certainly provide the traditional set of materials. And in, in the way that the training unfolds, there's, um, you know, uh, elaborations or, you know, really implementation is the best word because, you know, Crowley's system is pretty skeletal in a lot of ways. And sure, you're supposed to learn X material, but how do you teach X material? How, what's, the, what's the modality that's going to be the best for that? Um, is there a way to kind of operationalize uh, a process of learning correspondences or, um, uh, you know, expanding on our understanding of the basic rituals of the pentagram or hexagram in, in ways that are useful. So a lot of, lot, plenty of the traditional materials, but a lot of elaboration too. I'm probably over answering your question now. No, 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 it's wonderful. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I said, how, how many uh, bodies of, of the Temple of the Silver Star are there? Because um, I suspect there are probably going to be people who are interested in how sure. they might get involved. Yeah. Well, first of all, I should say there's two branches of the Temple of the Silver Star. There's an academic track and an initiatory track. And so far, we've been talking about the initiatory track. Mm -hmm. um, but the academic track does not require um, physical attendance at any meetings or uh, even physically meeting with the teacher. So we got people all over the world doing that via a webcam training. It's not astral initiations or distance initiations or anything like that it's simply people um, having some materials they study at home and and get coached on by an instructor but it's, um, so i mean it's not it's i mean academic makes it sound like it's just it's just reading it still involves active work it's just not absolutely work yes. in the group. daily magical practice daily meditation as well as what we think of as traditional academic approaches to doing some book reports and things like that um diary keeping uh, the difference between the academic track and initiatory track is that all that stuff in the academic track is brought into the initiatory track, plus a whole lot more based on the degree work that you're doing based on the Kabbalistic tree of life. So it's uh, in a, in a cipher manuscripts, the golden dawn as a pattern. So um, for people who are drawn to in-person ritual work with a group, the initiatory track is there and we have 
um, two active temples right now, full temples in Sacramento and Los Angeles. We have uh, Proneoi, which is like the, the uh, step down level of organization for a group. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Proneoi in the Bay Area, California, and uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, here where I am, um, in the Albany, New York area, um, in the UK, um, and in Seattle, and growing all the time because we have where pockets of initiates exist, the chances are, you know, a group Oops. will form eventually. Um, so uh, you go to tots.org, T-O-T-S-S dot org, and there are online applications for both the academic and initiatory track, a pretty thorough FAQ, um, but that's the portal. I mean, it, it seems pretty fascinating. Um, you know, oh, oh, I had a question because I, I was just talking to a person yesterday um, and in this, th their question was actually related to the Golden Dawn, um, but I think that, that your opinion is inter of interest to me in this area. Um, if someone is involved in, let's say someone's involved in another AA lineage that is not mm -hmm. part of your track, but they've done a bunch of work um, and, it, 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 and they came to you and they said, I would like to join your AA or the, the TOTS, you know, would, would you force them to go through sort of all of the preliminaries before coming in or would you sort of take a look at their, at, at their work and, and see where they, you know, were at? Sure. Um, the answer varies, differs slightly depending on whether we're talking about AA or Temple of the Silver Star. But um, while, um, while we do our, our administration in both, you know, certainly reserves the right and has the power to recognize initiates at site as Crowley often did, mm -hmm. where, you know, okay, I, I know you haven't come through these grades, but I think you're a 8-3 or something. You know, we, we recognize that's that's possible, but extremely rare. It ought to be extremely rare um, because the, the margin for error is, is great there. Um, so uh, for the most part, well, first of all, someone could be working, have, could have worked or continue to be working in some AA other than my own claimant group. That's not a bar to their their membership in Temple of the Silver Star. the The best way to understand it is is by simply saying that, uh, in terms of AA of any stripe in Temple of the Silver Star, membership in one does not uh, mandate or um, block uh, membership in another. It doesn't imply membership in one doesn't imply membership in another or uh, you know, create any barriers. Um, for AA, if someone comes to us and they've been working in another uh, claimant group, um, in a vast, vast majority of cases, the, the, the necessary thing is to start at the beginning. Otherwise, we don't have a sense of um, knowing for sure the work they've done and having a chance to work with them and get to, to know them and their magical work in a way that we need to in order to um, effectively train them but also um uh ethically advance them you know right i mean it, it seems like ultimately being asked to be given a, something that you didn't earn in an organization is also a manifestation of a sort of ego inflation <laughs> in a way yeah. if, if, you know if you did it once you can do it again um yeah. right i mean you don't you don't go to one university and then go to another university and say right. you you need to give me a degree also you know right so, <laughs> so um i want to talk a, a a couple of minutes about sort of more more practical aspects of your of your mm -hmm. personal work here so you um you you published somewhat recently a, a book on the on the 30 aethers and your and your visions of those things what was the what yeah. was the what was the Sort of a ritual technology that you utilize to do those did you do you publish that in the book i haven't read it yet yeah yeah in the back of the book there is the the suggested technique and it's the one i used for for the aether scryings um a very simple technique with uh, utilizing the the tablets from which the governor's names of the particular aether are drawn mm -hmm. and uh the calls that uh that activate them um and so uh, and then just this kind of uh, scrying the, the space. Um, my particular scrying approach um, is is more. It doesn't rely on a, a stone or 
you know, a mirror or anything like that. That's just, that's just me. I just kind of do the go inward and, and, uh, and find what you find. But for some people, um, and I always say it's, it's less about the tech and more about the results for some people, a physical, uh, you know, scrying apparatus helps, but the technique itself I used was very, very simple with the calls and the tablets. Cool. So, um, and do you do a lot of other Enochian work as well, or, or was the, the Aethers really your main focus? Um, no, it's, I mean, in, in Temple of Silver Star as a, as a Golden Dawn type organization, you know, we've got the Enochian work integrated pretty tightly uh, um, throughout um, and more explicit, you know, teachings on that in the second order, as you might expect. Um, and uh, so in my, in my personal work, I would say the Enochian system overall is probably the one I use the most personally um, in terms of, uh, you know, if I have a magical aim in mind uh, of some kind, not just the mystical aspect of the scrying. That, that was where I was going to go next, which is in, in what ways do you utilize sort of, you know, as a, as a psychologist and a down to earth fellow, <laughs> in, in what, where, where, do, where does the practical magic and, and sort of, you know, doing sorcery of various sorts uh, fall in your life? Um, well, I, I do think most of the time I'm functioning uh, it, 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 as more of a mystic. Um, this is probably Sora Merrill's influence, Phyllis. That's her yes. magical name for those who don't know, uh, Phil Sackler. Um, so trying to stay in touch with my own Holy Guardian Angel uh, and keep that link um as vibrantly alive in my day-to-day -day life as possible um sort of like one has to cultivate a marriage um you don't just get married and then it always is the same after that um this might be a good time quickly to to say what i mean by holy guardian angel because that's a term that is, sounds sounds like a good thing to do yeah <laughs> um, that was crowley's term for um which she stated in some places was intentionally uh, ridiculous uh, to, to, it was his term for uh, in some ways he talked about it as the inmost self, a higher self. In other places he was emphatic that this was an external entity. Um, the good news on that is that you don't have to have the answer to that question if you do the work that gets you to the threshold of that attainment because you won't have any questions about what it is to you once it's happening. Uh, but in any case, the the forging the conscious connection to the Holy Guardian Angel, which Crowley termed as knowledge and conversation, uh, well, in the traditional term that Crowley adopted, uh, is the cornerstone of the, is, is the first major attainment within the AA system. And it brings more conscious awareness of of the true will. Uh, so that's why it's so important in, in our the limit context to undertake that connection to the Holy Guardian Angel because it, it brings forth full conscious awareness of the true will. Um, Next possible so, sticky wicket question. I, I want to sure. we'll, we'll get back to the other thing that we were talking about a moment ago, the practical work and the um, sure. but um, what do you think of um, uh, J. Daniel Gunther's uh, books on on this sort of philemic metaphysics? Um, mm. that when I, when I read them, it's, it seemed like they were kind of going in a weird direction in some ways from mm -hmm. what I, what I had experienced from reading Crowley, <laughs> but what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think the best way I could sum that up would be that it struck me as about half statements of accepted sort of truths about what Crowley's system is and then a half idiosyncratic interpretations that were presented more or less as doctrine uh, which is fine if someone you know for himself or you know someone working with him likes that and and finds a spiritual home there that's great um, but uh, it it's I think it I would at least say it's important for people to recognize that this is one person's interpretation of things in, in a lot of cases and there's plenty of room for a lot of other interpretations. One of the lucky things about Thelema is that that's sort of built into the system, right? I mean, it's a- <laughs> Ought to be, yep. <laughs> yeah. 
an individual's choice which way they're going to go. So so back to the <laughs> back to the holy guardian angel and and um, it, it go it, you 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 have more of a mystical focus most of the time rather than a. Uh, um, I, I, the best way to, to put that would be that yeah my 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 day to day focus is often much more uh, of, a, of a mystical um, an attempt to stay you know mystically in tune with the HGA uh, to to have that voice tightly integrated into my conscious life uh, in every way possible. Um, but uh, I do uh, regular daily magical work as well, uh, you know, daily hygienic rituals, um, pentagram, hexagram rituals and such, uh, middle pillar type rituals um, or practices. Um, and occasionally when there's a specific magical aim that I, that I want to, you know, I wanna um, consecrate a talisman for a particular purpose or something like that, um, I would either be using Enochian work, um, some of Crowley's sex magic is useful too. And also a major influence for me is just uh, kind of classical Kabbalistic magic where you're working with the, the hierarchies uh, from the tree of life and uh, you know, fine tuning them based on the path or this, this sphere that you're working with. Now, those are three very different approaches, although they can be somewhat integrated with one another, I yep. suppose. But um, the the sort of ritual structure that you're utilizing from them uh, for that, is that something that you that you teach within um, the Temple of the Silver Star, or is that something that's your own that you keep to yourself? Uh, no, it, the, it, there's elements of both there and, and the answer to that question, but uh, certainly any mag magician that's been working this long and you know and this deeply into these systems is going to customize a lot of stuff uh, that's just inevitable and ought to be um, but the basic tools that i'm using are things that we do teach uh, in the temple of the silver star so you'd certainly get exposure to to um, all these traditional techniques is there have you published I, I know you've written a few books have you published any books that contain any sort of practical magical um, applications in them uh, yeah, in, uh, in Living Philema, which was uh, published in 2013. Um, and of course, the podcast of the same name has been going since 2010. Um, and there, there I, I introduced people to the basic rituals, but also like pentagram, hexagram rituals, but also um, kind of lay out some suggested ritual construction methods and give some sample rituals for particular magical aims. Um, I include... There's chapters on sex magic in there. There's um, uh, chapters on understanding the uh, training tracks of AA and some practical elements there. So yeah, I think Living Thelema has, uh, with the exception of Winds of Wisdom, having all the Enochian Aether scrying stuff, I think there's quite a bit of, of practical uh, material in, in Living Thelema because that's been my intention for that whole podcast and book from the beginning is to it, this is not history this is not as much theory as it is what can you take into the world and and have a practical benefit from i mean i think that's that's terrific um so uh i feel like there's a lot of other areas that we could talk about but i feel like this is a, this has been a good um <laughs> basic introductory conversation hopefully we can talk again in the future sure. um the if, if you were if you were to give one piece of advice to a, a young magician who's just who's just you know read through young and discovered regardi and is now yeah. is now uh, on his way into joining a thelemic order what what kind of advice do you think that you you would give that person you probably have the opportunity to do that sometimes but sure sure um uh, i think the most important thing for the beginner is to is to know how universal it is to feel lost, you know, to to feel lost in a sea of books and other resources, and feel like no matter where you start, you should have started ten other places to understand where you actually started with. Um, that's normal, and and uh, to some extent, that never goes away. Uh, don't don't interpret that as being off course. Um, and also, the, the second equally important thing that I've said before and I'll repeat is um, just being persistent, you know, to know also how universal it is to feel 
to go through dry spells, to feel lost, to feel like you're off track, don't know what you're doing, imposter syndrome, all that stuff. Uh, ego plays all kinds of tricks on us in that way. But uh, when I see people just get back on the horse when they feel like they've fallen off and, and persist, um, progress continues. Sometimes it won't feel like progress. Sometimes you'll feel stuck. That doesn't mean you are stuck. Um, and it doesn't mean you're not learning. Uh, so just the persistence is so important.